Hi, I'm Dawn. I'm a breast cancer survivor. Um, there is a statistic out there, it's a bit phenomenal. 50,000 women a year are actually diagnosed with breast cancer. Gosh, even I can't even get my head around that. But to find out more, come see my cancer story and all the other cancer stories that are out there. Hi, my name's Dawn Cropper, but no longer. It's now Dawn Tobin, because I recently got married. Um, I was born in Leicester. I've lived in Leicester most of my life. I've been here and there, but most of my life I've been in Leicester. I've got a real brother and a real sister. They're younger than me, so I've always been the role model and still am. I have a daughter who's 16. Her name's Zoe. Um, she was a struggle to bring into the world, but she's still here to tell the tale. Um, and she's pregnant, which I'm not very happy about, but these things happen, don't they? It's just the way the world is. Um, I've got a very big family, because of stepbrothers, stepsisters, step, step, you know, half and all the rest of it, stepmums and stepdads and all the rest of it. It's quite complicated, really. But, yeah, um, and I, I was diagnosed with breast cancer in August 2009, and it was stage 3B, and it was in my left breast. <laughs> So Dawn Cropper's here and she's kindly agreed to come and tell us about her experiences with the diagnosis of a breast cancer. And I know obviously we've met before, um, the story of your initial diagnosis is actually quite interesting. Yeah. What, what happened on mm. that occasion? Uh, I got invited out on a girly um, outing to go pole dancing. Bit of a strange thing to do, I know, but there you go. I thought it'd be a bit of a giggle. Um, I met some really good friends actually, there was a lady there with lung cancer actually, she was doing it as well, um, which inspired me to get going on with it because obviously she was more than not, well I didn't know at the time but she really inspired me anyway. So um, anyway, while we was doing something I, I really hurt myself and took the wind out my cells and I really grasped for breath and I don't know, I just really hurt myself. Anyway, so I sat down, took a breather and watched everyone else have a giggle, as you do. You know, laughing at everybody else falling over. Although you can't do it yourself either, so they laugh at you. Anyway, a bit later on, we was doing some exercises like sit-ups and press-ups, and, you know, it's a bit like a warm-down sort of thing. And as I was doing it, sweat was pouring off me. I thought, I really can't do this. I really cannot do this. So um, I just sat and watched everyone else. I didn't care what the instructor said. I thought, I've hurt myself and I can't do it. Anyway, when I went home, I was all right. It wasn't too bad. But when I went to bed, I thought, that really hurt. For some reason, I touched myself, and there it was, one huge lump. And I said to my partner, I says, can you feel this, or am I imagining this? No, I can feel that. You're going doctors tomorrow, is what his initial reaction was. I went, yeah, right, yo. And off to sleep, I went. Never thought any more about it. <laughs> now, how worried were you in that stage? Because um, it sounded like you were quite relaxed, but... Yeah, I was, but then I wasn't. It was just a kind of... You know, you just get on with it, don't you, kind mm. of thing. I thought, yeah, I'll go doctors when I feel like it. But actually, I was on a Be Clear on Cancer project at the time, and I was a volunteer going out telling people the earlier the diagnosis, the better the prognosis, and about those early signs and symptoms. And I thought, I really can't just sit here and not go doctors. I'm telling anyone else to do it. What kind of person am I? not to do it so then I went and booked myself in at the doctors. So you had a kind of insider knowledge really from your, a your little work. bit I just started on I just start I've been there for about six months mm. and then found I got the breast cancer so yeah I got a little bit of knowledge but it, it was triggering. Mm. What kind of role model would there be if I didn't follow what I was telling anyone else? How um, was the diagnosis actually made when you know it led up to somebody? Well I went to a the woman called, who was a clinician at the doctors and she told me there was nothing wrong to go home that was the first point. Absolutely loathe the woman. I, ne I never went to her again. She told me to give it a couple of weeks. Well, the way she did it, I knew it was wrong. Anyway, I didn't even wait a couple of weeks. I gave it, I gave it a week and went back. It was niggling. It was a bit niggly. I thought, well, either it is or it isn't. So anyway, I went to another one. She um, said, right, we're not messing about. She rang up that day. I got a phone call that day to go straight to the hospital within a week. 
So I was very fast-tracked on that point, which is what the first clinician should have done, mm -hmm. instead of waiting. What happened in the hospital after you went to see them? <clears throat> um, well, I had a mammogram, I had an ultrasound. Um, no, I had an ultrasound first, then I had a mammogram, then I went back for another ultrasound, and then they said, we're not worried about your breast, the mammogram didn't show anything untoward, um, but on the ultrasound there was enlarged lymph nodes under the arm, so they did a biopsy there and then, and that was on the same day. And then I had to go back the following week for the results. How do you feel that process was handled when you came for the results? Um, they were very good. I had my friend Paula with me at the time. She was the only person that knew. I thought, well, I'm not going to tell everyone in case it's nothing to worry about. There's no point getting everyone worried. But Paula's got a very weird sense of humour. So in the waiting room we were laughing, we were joking. It was probably inappropriate to some people, but it was our way of coping. So, um, yeah, that wasn't too bad, thankfully, for having Paula there. Mm. So I think it can be important to take somebody with you. If even possible. just one person, yeah, someone that you trust that knows, you know, won't tell anyone. And not everyone's able to do that. No, I mean, not about, everyone. About I mean, some 30%. people don't. Some people don't like to. I mean, my friend Maureen doesn't like anyone there with her at all. She likes to deal with it on her own. own. But it's each to her, you know, what you want. Yeah, I guess it's a personal choice, providing yeah. there is somebody who you can take if you want to take. Yeah. One thing we're trying to do here, which hasn't really got off the ground yet, is provide people with an advocate if they don't have somebody who they can uh, personally take as a friend or yeah, family member. Yeah, a bit like a befriending project. Yeah, that would be really like good, that. that would. Yeah. So It's uh, someone out of the family then, isn't it, as well? So what did they actually tell you about your diagnosis at that, at that moment? Um, they said that they found cancerous cells in the lymph nodes, so then they went delving for three biopsies in the lump, and then I had to wait another week. I'll tell you what, it's like waiting for eternity results. It's a long process. It is. It? A, a, week is a week is a very, very long time while waiting for results. Mm. I mean, the first week I just kept myself so busy, I didn't have time to keep my feet on the floor, and I was so tired by the end of the day, I just slept. Intentionally, you used that as a technique. Yeah, I did for the first people. week, but the second week, it, um, I couldn't do the same. It was just another week of worry. And um, unfortunately, some people have even longer waits for yeah. various reasons. I, I know my friend was waiting for months for a little boy to go through some different tests, but that, mm. that must be horrific. Mm. A week's, you know, ages, but months is even worse. Sometimes when you're given the diagnosis, people vary on how much information they actually want, and clinicians struggle to know, should I give like as much information as possible or just the minimum information that's necessary. What's your view on that? I'd like to know everything, mm. but that's just my opinion. Yeah. I like to know everything inside and out, and upside down and topsy-turvy. Yeah. I do. And did you feel you got that information? Um, you know, it was such a long while ago, it's really hard to remember. And of course, you're under the, you know, you hear the word cancer and everything just switches off, doesn't it? Which is why you need someone there to take in the extra information. You do get given lots of booklets, but if you, if you want to read, that's great. If you don't like reading, then you're not going to look at that. But there is the internet. There are some good sites for that, which is where I went, I think. I did go on the internet. Are there any you can specifically recommend? Well, the NHS one and the Breast Cancer site are definitely two good ones. Yeah. And then we've got the Be Clear on Cancer. There's a few little things on there as mm -hmm. well that helps. The reason I ask is because sometimes people get into trouble when they find things they well, don't they want to Well, they tell you dead, don't they? You know, they do go from one extreme to the other. But yeah, the Breast Cancer and the NHS. And Matt Millen's quite good too. What about informal support, that would be things like chat rooms or putting you in contact with other patients? Well, the breast cancer does that. Mm. They do do that. I've never done it myself. I've done it via Facebook and on the breast cancer I've made friends and then we've just got together and I've made a friend called Sue who lives in Nottingham. We quite see each other quite a lot now. Oh, you actually meet up as well? Yeah. And yeah. you met, met that friend through Facebook? Facebook, wow. yeah. Wow, I mean, that shows yeah. you how things are going these days, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Because we also try to, to kind of facilitate those links, but it's not always possible. No. In I've fact, got a couple of other friends, but they live in America and New York. They, you know, they're quite away. But they have offered me to go over, so it might be something I take up on. Fantastic. Why, yeah, why not? definitely. So what, um, what else have you found that's been useful along the way? I know we haven't gone through the full story yet. We'll come back to that. But uh, any other, from the perspective of somebody coming new to this, what, what would you uh, kind of recommend w would be a good approach to this whole thing about how to cope with a really difficult diagnosis? Well, mine was just talking about it, really. I know some people find that really difficult, and coping with cancer are amazing. 
Um, so that's I'm, a voluntary body that yeah. we have in Leicester that yeah. uh, is um, I go to an umbrella branch in Burstall called Burstall Bags and th there's all the ladies in there, it's all been through either the support. same sort of thing or they've had partners die of it and things yeah. and they're all there to help you, you know, it's wicked I wish I'd done it years ago. So you actually definitely an advocate of the group support programme where, where other patients are helping each other? Yeah. I mean, we don't always talk about cancer. We have a laugh, we have a giggle, you know, it's just like normal things. But there's someone there to talk to if you come in in floods of tears, so. How often do you go to that? I one? go once, it's it's every second and fourth Wednesday. Mm. And then there's also one at Loughborough, and I've been to that for a couple of times just to help out with the lady that runs it, just to give her a bit of moral support. Well, that's good. So, yeah. So that's definitely a tip for people to um, try to talk about the situation probably more than they necessarily would by their natural instincts sometimes. yeah yeah maybe because you don't know the people and you've got something in common and it, you know it's not going to go back to your family so you mm. haven't got that worry i mean there is a temptation for some people to say i'll just try and handle this on my own i, I won't i won't burden other people <clears throat> like some people even say well i won't tell my family in case they get upset or i won't tell my friends because i don't want to see me i don't want to see uh, them looking at me as a different person mm -hmm. It's a difficult one, isn't that, it? That does happen, because I've had lots of friends that have disappeared and new friends that have come in, so that can happen. I can kind of understand that. But at the end of the day, if they don't want to be there, then they're not worth the paper they're written on. The friends that are friends that want to be there and stand by you won't see you any different, whether you've got hair, no hair, whether you've got boob or no boob. Mm. So they're the friends that you need. You want positive people in your life that keep you going. Mm. Not negative people looking, oh, woe is me, well, you get rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't got time for them. Okay. <laughs> so let's talk about your cancer journey a little bit more because um, after the diagnosis usually comes the offer of treatment. Now usually when treatment's offered, either chemotherapy or radiotherapy or surgery, of course, those three big things, um, people don't necessarily know entirely what to expect. No. What, what can you reflect on having gone through um, your treatments? What did you have first of all? I had the chemo first of all. Absolutely loathed it. Mm. Um, never have it again. I've told them that. They'd have to find me some different, I mean, alternative medicine because they're all out there. Mm. They just don't tell you. What went wrong for you in the um, chemotherapy? It, well, there was lots of things. One, I felt like I was a meat, meat, piece of meat on a conveyor belt. There was no rapport with any nurses. They didn't put you at ease. They didn't tell you what was going to happen until after it happened. They were too late with their information. It had already happened by the time they told me. And I couldn't have anyone sit next to me, so you're apprehensive as it is. Um, and it was just awful. And the second lot, because I had FEC T, the, the red stuff wasn't too bad apart from being sick, but the steroids caught, soon sorted that out. But the tosidaxel tough, that, that put me in a wheelchair. It took me off my legs. Was it too strong for you? Or? Uh, well, in the end, they told me I was allergic to it, so I shouldn't have had it in the first place. There were some specific side effects which didn't... Well, yeah, it just stopped my legs from completely working, and I and got diarrhoea, and I couldn't even get to the diarrhoea toilet for it. It was awful. You had diarrhoea and a neuropathy, I think. I don't know what I had, but I know at one time I rang up and they said that, that it was just a side effect, and mm. the next time I went in, they said, well, you should have been in hospital. Yeah. So there you go. So you, de you definitely struggled with chemotherapy. Yeah, and definitely. The regime they gave you was really difficult to tolerate. Yeah. And I, I worked myself up to losing my hair. And um, obviously when it started coming out, it was absolutely devastating. And I said to myself, if ever that happened again, I'd just shave the lot off. Mm. It's easier to deal with. You think you can cope with it, but actually you can't. It's yeah. awful. Yeah, that's very um, difficult to know how anyone would cope until it happens yeah. to you, isn't it? Yeah. And well, I thought I thought it was ready for it, but as it started coming out, it was absolutely mortifying. And how long did it actually go on for? I mean, that process from when <clears> it started? I think it was the second lot of chemo mm -hmm. to probably the fourth lot. Yeah. And so, how, in weeks, how many is that? Um, it was every three weeks, wasn't it? So three, six, nine, probably about nine weeks, mm -hmm. maybe ten. Did you find you had good advice regarding what to do, regarding the wig options in the NHS or out of the NHS? Well, that's where Coping Cancer came in with that. They did the Headstrong, and that was very good. However, I was on my own, so I couldn't really banter off anyone with that. It was just me and this other lady that was showing how to do it. Mm. 
Um, it would have been better with a big group. You could have all had a laugh and a bit of a joke about it rather than it being so deadly serious. I think they're improving that locally right yeah, now. Yeah, th well, they've moved it into the new Macmillan in the Royal, they which have, looks yeah. a great big thing. And I've done the look good, feel good, and they've moved that into there as well. But that is well worth doing, especially when you've That's lost great. all your eyebrows and your eyelashes and you've got no facial hair. Can you say for people what that is? Um, they give you the makeover. You actually learn how to make up your face and put on eyebrows and stuff, but they give you loads and loads of goodies. <laughs> it's well worth it. It's not cheap stuff either. No, it's, no, definitely, it's definitely worth doing. Yeah. I come out feeling fantastic from that. Yeah, and when's that available to people? Um, I'm not sure. I think it's once a month or something. You just ring up and get on. Yeah. There's no problem. As long as you've been affected by cancer, they don't stop you from going. Okay. And you can take a friend if you feel a bit uncomfortable. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Now, I didn't. You... I went on my own. But you can, apparently you can take a friend. I don't know that. I probably would have done, but I didn't know at the time. Let's go back to your treatment. So yeah. you, you managed to go through the chemotherapy. Yeah. It was really difficult. I take that on board. Yeah. What, what, what was uh, the next treatment that you had? A mastectomy, which I really didn't want. I didn't want that at all. I was hoping that the lump had shrunk enough to um, just You're hoping take for the lump. a lumpectomy where they just take the local yeah, area. Yeah, but they didn't. They took the whole breast. And I cancelled it one time around because I just couldn't deal with it. Really? What, what was... I mean, that's... A big thing to cancel an operation like that. No, I just wasn't ready. I mean, my partner weren't talking at the time, and all he did was ring my mum, and all I did was shove my mum away, and it was him I wanted it at the time, but he didn't get that. So, yeah, so I wasn't in a good frame of mind to even deal with it. So you, on your your side, you cancelled it. Yeah. And you did go back for it eventually. Yeah. How long was that gap? Um, well, I should have gone in February, but I went in March. Yeah. It wasn't too long ago because Doctor Sh like Doctor Sh said, the longer you leave it, the worse it is. So it was a case of do it or not. But it's interesting that you did take that initiative to to delay it. Well, I knew I had to do it, yeah. but I, it was just being in the right frame of mind. Once we sorted everything out, it was not a problem. Then yeah. once I did it, I come out through it, and it was fine. Now, did they offer you any um, options during the surgery? Uh, what do you mean? Reconstruction or...? No, not at the time, because of radiotherapy, because it ruins the skin, doesn't it? If you don't have radio, you can have it there and then, but I didn't know that at the time. I just know they didn't offer it me, and yeah. people come out saying, well, I've had mine already. I'm thinking, why? But it's because of the radio. How, um, how satisfied were you with the result of the surgery? Very. She's done a brilliant job. Yeah. Very neat. So you you didn't have any qualms after the surgery? No, no, I was fine after that. Yeah. Apart and from a bit back of lymphoma, but I didn't get that. I was very fortunate. Yeah. Lymphedema, yeah. yeah. I didn't get that. Um, going back to you know this question about the surgery, so I know you were really nervous about it, you delayed it, but looking back on it, would you say, given how well it went, do you think you would uh, have gone through it perhaps easier if you knew what it was coming up? Was it one of these things where it actually was easier if you'd have known it rather than more difficult? No, it wasn't that. It was just me and my partner at the time. We were yeah. just going through a difficult patch. OK. I think it was that more than anything else. Yeah. And just being in the right frame of mind to deal with it. Yeah. If you'd gone in bad in the wrong frame, you would have come out with the wrong frame. I needed to go in with the right frame to come out with the right frame, and that worked, so... You had radiotherapy, I think, after the yeah, after uh, that. surgery. Yeah. How long did the radiotherapy go on for you? Uh, 25 sessions. Over how many weeks, roughly? I think it was five. Yeah. So it was every five days. Well, it was every week. Wasn't Quite it, intense, in a way. It is, yeah. Yeah, it was a walk in the park compared to the other two. I was just about to say that. Yeah. Compared to the chemotherapy and the yeah. surgery. It was a walk in the park. And at least every day they asked you how you were, how you were feeling. You never got that on, on the chemo at all. So you found the radiotherapy uh, treatment radiographers more Yeah, involved. much more pleasant and more hands-on and mm. kind of understood, really. That's good. Yeah. Because they've got a busy job as well, haven't they? Yeah. Where, and the, again, with the wards on 23A, I mean, the nurses and stuff, they've all been through it, and they, they were fantastic for getting you out of the hospital. Yeah. rehabilitation process like that's the process between the end of treatment and getting back towards where you want to be well there isn't any is there it Not just formally. stops you're right there is it a stop there is an issue a big issue and I know you and I have talked about and you before. need to be you always like a drug really you need to be weaned off it you yeah. have all that attention for all that time and all of a sudden you've got nothing and your mind just does overtime it's a big sudden drop, isn't it? It is. In, in it is from input. all that to nothing. It's a huge leap. 
Was it literally nothing, or did you have um, the occasional contact from the it was dress like, care nurses? I had to know. I didn't even have that. Um, I suppose you could ring them, but I still don't know the name of my breast cancer nurse, so I can't even ring her. Um, it was seeing the um, oncology every six months. That was the, the follow only, up, just a routine follow. That was all I got really. Mm. So from being for five it, weeks to perhaps six months. And seeing the oncologist is in the clinic, is it? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's in the royal. Yeah. I do see the breast cancer one every year, Yeah, uh, Dr. Takui. So basically you went directly into kind of a routine monitoring scenario where you were just being seen occasionally. Yeah. So I guess what's missing, t correct me if I'm wrong, but some kind of transition yeah. from all that intense acute it is. care to saying, well, you're doing well on your own. We, do, we don't need to see you. But I guess the NHS being what it is now, under pressure of funding, tends to push you towards saying, well, you, you know, we don't really need to do anything now. It's very different to but the scan. But still do patient groups, surely, you yeah. know, different things, or get you involved with something, and then if you don't want to go there, that's your choice. And it, I agree, and there are other things you could do. But they don't give you all that information, really. No. I mean, I guess if there's a gap and the voluntary sector is able to compensate, they could point you in the right direction. But having a gap and not, not signposting where to go, that's a big problem. Well, again, I mean, you're given leaflets, but again, you shove them in the drawer. So really, they could do with recapping over that, maybe. There's this available, there's this available, there's this available. There's nothing because you like do forget. a personal contact saying, this is, th these are the options. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely hearing what you're saying there. It's very different, by the way, in this Scandinavian model where they offer rehabilitation oncology as a specialty and actually try to follow people up with specific things like getting back to work, physiotherapy if they need it, other types of uh, complementary treatments, things like that, that yeah, can be added yeah, in definitely. to the yeah. routine. I love my complementary therapy, it's brilliant. What did you actually do in that regard? Um, what complementary therapy? Well, it's through the COVID with cancer, it's the best old bags that I go to. Yeah. I've been going for two years now, um, but which I didn't one, find that begin to begin with. Which ones did they offer you though? Um, I could have any, as, uh, because obviously I've finished all my treatment, but when you're on chemo they have to be very careful because of different oils and different things like that. Is that aromatherapy? Yeah, well, it's the oils you use, but there's Indian head, there's reflexology, there's um, Indian Reiki. Head massage, yeah. And I've just learned to do Reiki myself, oh, I've just wow. done level one, so. That's great. So yeah. you can disseminate that to others? Well, I will do, when I've done my level two I'm allowed to, which I'm doing in November, so yeah. What are the levels? Uh, there's three. And they're, they're different levels of expertise, are um, Yeah, the first one's just friends and family and you can't charge or do anything, it's just practising. Yeah. Second level, you can. And then third level, you're a making mass and you can teach somebody else. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. a good skill to develop. It is, sure. actually, yeah. It's very, my life has completely changed since I've done that. It's very calm, very relaxed. No more rushing and bussing and stressing. Yeah, it's completely different. <laughs> so that is a great tip for people watching, that those complementary treatments, which, let's be honest, they're not, they're not always available. Sometimes no. you have to seek them out. And, um, you they're know, around. Yeah, they're, they're around. around, but sometimes you have to pay for yeah. them. Yeah. Well, ours is just donations, mm. because it's coping with cancer. Yeah. So, and there is a big bunch of us usually that go. So, yeah. Let's come on to the effects on the family and your partner, because that <coughs> could be a sensitive topic. Mm, it can way. be, yeah. What was your feeling about how your partner coped? By the way, congratulations on the <laughs> wedding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's still around, bless him. <laughs> he's been my rock, he's been my saviour. I mean, yeah, he's had his problems, obviously, but men don't really talk about them, do they? They tend to bottle them up. Uh -huh. So, but he, he did say once he did want counselling, but then all of a sudden he said he was all right. So whether it's because he just actually got it out in the open, I don't know, but... Do you feel there should be any, a resource for caregivers and <clears throat> family members? I think there should be some more stuff available, yeah, even if it's for them to just go off. I mean, you know, even if it's private sessions. Do they get anything from the voluntary sector in coping with cancer in your experience? They probably would if they came along, but obviously they were at work, so it's very difficult. So that's usually during work time, isn't it? So that's quite hard. They could do some time off for that. But yeah, I'm sure they, yeah. So it's for parents and carers. Um, it's for people that's been affected by cancer, not just people that have had cancer, so yeah. Mm. I often take a friend along sometimes that's been with me for a while. What was your impression of how worried <clears throat> about the, can, your health and your future health your partner uh, was you know, through, all, through all this compared to you? 
do they have do they also have high levels of anxiety stress depression well yeah but he was depressed i would say and yes he was very stressed but he wouldn't show it mm. um my fear was him loving me with only one breast obviously mm -hmm. i mean they just tell you what you need to hear but that's not good enough all the time I mean, these these issues about body image and your confidence and self-esteem. Yeah. Sometimes we don't really address those before. No. We just leave it to the person to just find out. Get on with it. Yeah. Yeah. It's not and ideal. Go is it? No, no. Because you do lose your self-esteem. You do lose your confidence, and you're losing part of your body. Having said that, some clinicians, some specialists, and some of the breast care team do definitely address that and bring that up. Um, I mean, thinking about it now, I can totally understand it's, it's a very delicate area. Um, is there anything you can say to, you know, viewers watching how they could um, deal with that? Because it's a big change to lose a part of your body. It is. Um, I had counselling before um, I lost my breast, which completely helped. Um, <clears throat> I think I'd have not gone through that, I might have suffered afterwards. And some people say, oh, no, they're fine up to the operation, then they suffer afterwards. So it's, it's finding the right balance and how you cope with it, I think. Um, like my partner says, oh, I love you no matter what, but you, you know, they're, they're just words. They're, anyone can say that, even my bloody mother. So <laughs> it wasn't really what I wanted to hear. Well, they're but, saying the right thing, but <laughs> it, was it actually what they really felt? Maybe not, but I don't know. I'd rather them say what they felt, really, and deal with that. You know, it, at the end of the day, it's a partnership, and you need to go through it together. It's your, both your journeys, isn't it? So were you two able to talk about that particular issue? Um, well, like I say, I had to cancel one operation because he wouldn't talk about it at all. It just involved my mum, and I didn't want my mum. I wanted him. Mm. Um, but I think he got over that initially, and that's when he said, well, I think I might need that counselling. I says, well, I'm sure I can get you some. Mm -hmm. But then well, after the operation, I came out the other side, so I think that kind of perked him up. I think he was just feeling what I was feeling, really. Maybe he was picking up on your emotions. Yeah, and maybe he was. you improved, he was yeah. improving too. Yeah. There was a time I thought I was you know, at the end of my tether, but that was through chemo because it really did make me poorly. So as time went on, how did you find <coughs> his adjustment to things um, went? All right. And okay. now? Oh, he's wonderful now. And how long are we down the line? Um, we're two, well, it's been two years since I've had in treatment, mm. so well, it's two and a half years now. Yeah. Three years next May, since I've had any radio mastectomy or anything. Now, if somebody met you for the first time, who, well, or let's say a friend who you haven't seen before in a, in a while, let's say before this happened, um, would they really see a difference in you? No. They'd think, they would think you're back to normal? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. That's got to be a good sign. Yeah, yeah. I've definitely I'm got my cockiness back and a yeah. bit of bullying and telling people what to do, yeah. I wasn't like that when I lost my breast. I, I was very withdrawn and quiet. I did lose my confidence a lot. You were definitely affected by it, but you, you got back to where you were. Yeah, now. reconstruction was definitely the answer. So tell tell us about the reconstruction. Oh, fabulous! I got to know everything there was inside and out. First of all, what were you offered, and when did um, it come up? Well, I wasn't offered. I was offered quite a lot, but I told him what I wanted because I see my friend when I'm on my step to me in the next bed, Linda. I'm still friends with Linda actually. She'd had. The, the bit from around the back with the implant, well, her implant still is not been blown up, and that's nearly three years now. So that completely put me off because she got an infection. So I knew which one I wanted anyway, wanted the tummy tuck one. Um, so I told Dr. Farmer that's what I wanted. I told him what I wanted. <laughs> I gave him a whole list of questions. There were about three pages of it. He says, you've done your homework, haven't you? <laughs> And then the, the booklet that I remember from last time that I couldn't remember the name was Crazy Hats that told it all about the reconstruction inside and out, every detail of how each nerve connected, how the tummy button connected. And that's all I needed to know, that I was in good hands, got a good blooming surgeon and what was going to happen. And I couldn't wait to go in. Mm. So you actually were looking forward to reconstruction? Yeah, I was. you knew it was going to make you yeah. feel more like yeah. a woman again? Well, the, re the reason for my decision was that the year before, in the December, my stepsister got married, and I'm looking for dresses. I was very, very limited. It was all like alter necks and different things like that. And I couldn't wear anything like that with one boob. It just looked awful. 
So obviously that knocked the wind out of my sails. And then the dress I did buy, I was yanking it all the time, thinking, can anyone see? And I even had a flower there, and I was still yanking at it. So I thought, no, now's the time. So that's when I decided I was going to do it. And I told him the day after the wedding, he says, right. I says, right, you're all ready for this, but reconstruction is next on the table. Well, that's a good thing. I says, it's not. It's a bloody eight-hour operation. It's not a great thing, is it? <laughs> Having said that, I'll, you know, it is an operation, isn't it? And yeah. uh, you've got to put yourself through it again. And some people find it very difficult to come to the hospital when they've had that experience of being ill. <clears throat> it's a reminder, yeah. isn't it, of being ill sometimes. But I, this well, is I don't know. I was in a different ward. I was in a different hospital, so it was completely different. Oh. And it was different nurses and different staff. Yeah. So it was... So you felt it was quite manageable? Yeah. Yeah. And then the operation, how long were you in for hospital? I, sh uh, I should have been in for a week. I was only in for four days. And that's pretty good going. I had the operation on the Thursday, was home on Sunday. Because I think they're trying to reduce the amount of time in hospital for this as much as they yeah. can. Yeah, yeah. And then um, how long to get back after the operation, you know, with the soreness and everything? So <coughs> well, they told me months and months and months, but I got the all, all clear in seven weeks. Because I was, I was really ready for it. I got myself mentally prepared for it. I knew what was going to happen. I got people on standby to cook, clean and lift kettles and stuff like that. And I did what I was told. I'd listened to my body. Yeah. If I couldn't do it, I didn't do it. If I could, then I would. But I just did little things. Whereas my friend Sue went out and hung out the washing and she's kind of... <laughs> she's still struggling about a year down the line. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a case of listen to your body and do what you're told. OK. But the scars are healing lovely. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So overall, looking back on everything you've been through, how satisfied are you with everything that happened to you? And would Apart you from do, the would chemo, the clinician, it was all right. Is there anything you really wished, well, that <clears> one thing, that could have been a lot better? I wish I'd give you alternative therapies, mm. other than the chemo and the mm. radio and the mastectomy. Yeah. I know there's other things out there, but they're not. I know they're not allowed to say, because... It's not part of their jurisdiction, is it? So, mm -hmm. But there are other things, are there? Do you mean uh, alternative instead like, of the chemotherapy? Yeah. Or as a top-up to it? No, instead of. Mm. So give, give people the option if they want it? Yeah. Mm. I think we should have more options and what we should be able to choose. And if we feel ill, that's our problem. It's not all down to the doctor then, is it? But mm. I, do, I do think there are other things out there that we can do. Mm -hmm. OK. So, definitely. And the other thing I would say is... I know you have steroids and you put on loads and loads and loads of weight. Please don't fret about it because you will lose it once you come off the steroids. I did. So, because my friend's on steroids and she's moaning about her weight. But mm -hmm. once she comes off from it, it will come off. Yeah. All right. And it won't drop off, but, you know, but it will come off gradually. There, there are certain drugs yeah. like the steroids. Yeah, the steroids definitely. You put, I put on about three stone with them. I look like a. But then I couldn't eat either, so because of being sick. But yeah, I definitely lost it again. So don't worry about that. That's the least of your worries. What was the reason for the steroids in your case? Being sick with a chemo. Mm. It helps with that. It stops the sickness. OK. So put on the weight, stop being sick. <laughs> definitely, because you'll lose the weight afterwards. Let's come on to what's going to happen in the future. I mean, obviously, nobody really knows what's going to happen, but I'm just interested in your view of the future right now, given mm -hmm. everything you've been through. Well, I've been to the doctors recently because I'm not very happy with my health. So he just fobbed me off. But if you're not happy with that, then go back to another one, which is what I'm doing. Well, I'm having to wait a week. My friend Sue did the same. She got fobbed off, but she went to her breast cancer nurse and she's got seen and she's had tests. I can't remember my breast cancer nurse, so... Please keep note of it, because obviously they can help more than the doctor sometimes. Is that an issue related to the previous um, <clears throat> diagnosis or something different? Well, I didn't get a breast cancer nurse until I went for my mastectomy, but I think you should be given one right from the very, very beginning, so at least you've got someone to talk to. Because you've always got questions. A you always contact, forget. If you like. Yeah. Mm. As soon as you walk out the room, you've got questions and vision for you. I wish I asked that. And then you never get another opportunity. Whereas mm. if you've got that number, it might help. And if she doesn't know, she'll find out for you. Mm. She'll do the legwork. Now, a lot of people, uh, even one, two, five years down the line, in the back of their mind, they have that fear of the cancer coming it's back. It's always going to be a fear. It never, ever goes away, really. How do you manage that? I don't know. You just have to. I've had counselling with Sue, so that's helped, definitely. With the psycho-oncology? Yeah, department. definitely. Mm -hmm. That has definitely helped. 
I've tried to keep myself busy, um, tried to join groups, volunteering, different things like that. And you, you do, you, you do move on, you, do, you know, because obviously some things I've stopped doing. Then I went back to work, I decided that that wasn't good enough, so I'm now my own boss and run my own business, so, you know. Wow, that's you just, fantastic. just have to, you know. I didn't know about that. No, no, what, well, what? it's a new thing. I've not been doing it very long myself. What area is that you're working uh, in? I d I'm a domestic cleaner. I go around people, people's houses and clean them, so, yeah. I was doing it for a lady, but I get more money doing it this way, so. so it's working well for you? Yeah, oh, yeah. Really I'm enjoying good. it. I go to work with a smile on my face. And it keeps me busy, it keeps my mind occupied, and I'm not thinking 24-7, I've got my cancer back. So you've got a role, you're doing well, you're leading yeah. that role. I go out and visit people. And I just contacts. keep myself busy, really. I'm never at home, and I wish I was sometimes, but then mm. if I'm at home, I'm dwelling, so. So there's a very good uh, lesson there about um, having a purpose in life yeah. after you know you're in remission and things are going well hopefully yeah. i know none, none of us ever can truly predict the future but no. whilst things are going reasonably well it's nice to capitalize yeah. on that i make a bucket list because i've got a bucket list and i've been ticking off loads so what have you been doing then um well i did the skydive raised a thousand pounds for coping with cancer um i want to do a wing walk but that's quite expensive but it, i will do it we'll do it now I'm working, I could save up the money. Um, I want to do Kilimanjaro, that's with Macmillan. There's an opportunity to do that. But I've got to get fit first, so that's next on the agenda. But to get fit, there's a moon walk where when you bra at night, so I'm going to do that next year. So I'll give that a go. That'll get me ready for Kilimanjaro. So that's 26 miles. <laughs> wow, that's impressive. So, yeah, and then I'm, I'm do whatever I can. I've done coffee mornings at the pub for coping with cancer and Macmillan and different things like that. I just keep myself busy. Yeah. So that's a very important lesson as well yeah. about keeping busy and that offsets the anxiety coming back yeah. by a form of distraction, really. But I think also the longer you go on doing positives, that offsets any fear of the negatives. Yeah, it can do. And yeah. have positive people in your life. Mm. Because all the negatives, you just make you, it just makes you... Yeah, you know, you know how they make you feel. So just have positive people, happy, chirpy people that are positive and want to do things in life and want to move forward like you do, really. Would you say you're a positive person overall? I, mean, I am. I try to be as positive as I possibly can. If I'm not positive, I am for other people. Oh, I just think positive, blah, blah, blah. I'm reading a book at the minute, How You Can Heal Your Life. That's quite a good, interesting book. Mm -hmm. That's about being positive. And to get the things you want, you've got to be positive and will them to you, yeah. And Reiki's definitely helped, so... But on my other bucket list, I want to go to see Wicked. I'm doing that in November. Um, I've obviously got married. That was on my bucket list. Um, I've been to, I've been to see um, a comedian, Jack D. He was very funny. Yeah, I like that. Oh, yeah, it was very funny. I went with Sue for that. My friend that's um, a breast cancer survivor. Um, what else is on my bucket list? There's loads. I've been to quite a few shows and different things, you know, things that are... I, I want to go to America, so my friend Lynetta is definitely on the list of doing just to get to America. Well, so. that, Dawn, that's an amazing list of things that you're oh, well, achieving. Just and forever go on, don't they? So. Wanting to achieve, even, <laughs> yeah. even more wanting to achieve. Yeah. That's such an important... Well, it keeps you going, target. and the cruise as well. I want to go to cruise, and we're doing that for a honeymoon next year. Fantastic. Well, given all those you know, early problems that you went through um, and the struggle you had getting everything sorted out and the fact that you had complications with treatment, it's wonderful to see you back on your feet and yeah, doing so well now. definitely, yeah. And uh, it's even better to see you know, you've got a positive <clears throat> outlook and you're determined to do as well as possible. Yeah, definitely. So I definitely wish you all the best for the Thank future. Thank you, yeah. yeah. I do with everybody else as well. And I don't mind giving my name and number if anyone wants to ring and have a chat or meet up, be friend or got any questions, not a problem. Fantastic. Thank you very much. That's not a problem.